yesterday, but they've done a lot of studies and clinical trials over yoga. So a few years ago, they took 100 people and put them out in Sedona to do a yoga retreat. And 15 of the people had done yoga before, 85 hadn't. And they did blood samples a month before, and then I think it was a week after, a month after, and then a year after. And the people that had continued to do yoga, you know, all their blood work was still like at a lower level for everything that was healthy and good, right? Those people that didn't do yoga, their cholesterol was higher and all those kinds of things. So, but it was a unique kind of yoga. It's not the type of yoga that most people would consider yoga, but it is what you've experienced this week. So what they did was like a physical class um, one day a week. And then the other six days they did a guided meditation. And so just being able to be in that meditative state for an hour a day really calms, relaxes you, just sets everything apart from you and helps you holistically. They also did a study with people in PTSD and they did an MRI of their amygdala. And they studied them over a long period of time and when they had done mindfulness and meditation, that form of yoga that I give you guys, something close to that, that the amygdala actually shrinks. And I don't know, did anybody talk about that with you guys at all? So then, people with PTSD and veterans and essential personnel, your amygdala sh enlarges. What is that? It's part of your brain. It's like right up here. There's usually a... a, a it's, it's the fight or flight. Yeah, mechanism. Fight. Into it early. Yeah. Right. It's, it's flight. Fight, flight, or breathe. Yep, it's that mechanism. And so it enlarges and what happens is you're always on the lookout, right? You are always have a heightened sense of awareness. You're always just unable to relax. You're unable to meditate. You're able to become, that threshold's really, really high for us, right? So you're the one that's always alert. It's hard for you to sleep. It's hard for you to relax. Your amygdala gets really, really enlarged. And what they did is a longer study over that and they've done MRI scans of those people before they started doing mindfulness and meditation. And then after years, they did it again. And what they realized is those people that did mindfulness and meditation on a regular basis, their amygdala actually shrinks. So it can change who you are truly physically. What, this might be very too new and too raw, but what is yoga and does it have anything can that do anything for TBI and CTE? What are those acronyms? Uh, traumatic brain injury, which is 60% of my disability. Mm -hmm. And CTE is, so half my job was to be the first vehicle and try to find the bombs. Well, in, I failed 19 times. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've been blown up pretty good 19 times. Right. So, for year, a couple, few years now, I've thought, and other people I've read on it, and kind of also thought that I could be at the beginning stages of CTE, which is the big concussion fucking uh, injury for football. Right. <clears throat> but from what I've been told by the VA and so on is, I can't find out until I get old enough until my brain deteriorates fast enough and to where they, I die or I kill myself and then they can slice over my brain and see and see if it's CTE. Right. You know, I, I'm, like I said, I, if I be very, I'm so serious. How? That, that's, so, that's, that's unfortunately the only way they can determine So, it's, like it's my, by, is there anything out there that's correlated, anything in yoga you know, or anything on the CTE that's reversal or stop? I would have to do some research, but what I can tell you from the research that I found that there's no negative side effects if you're doing yoga appropriately, yeah. mentally, physically, and spiritually. So it can reduce your amygdala. And I, I, a couple of days ago, I talked about the route of your synapse, right? And then if you have gratitude and you're thankful that you're going to continue to think that way, if you're thinking negative, it's, you know, synapses are going to follow the path of least resistance, just like water. Yeah. So being mindful and being meditative can reprogram your brain into being thankful to be more centered to be more mindful but it, like i said it's something that takes a while it's not gonna you're gonna feel better 
you know, but the longer you do it, the better and healthier it is for you, right? The, the longer you eat healthier foods, right, and you don't eat unhealthy foods, it's going to be better for you in the long term, right? The more mobility that you have that's not overextending yourself, right, and you're not doing too little exercise, you're not doing too much, you find that happy medium for you, the healthier you're going to be. I mean, all those things are proven facts. So I can guarantee you that'll work. But if you keep in touch with me and you send me back those acronyms, I can look and see what research or if there's been any research done for those. Um, one, thing that, one thing that does in the research shows is that you can hyper agitate or speed up the, the issue of the screen time. Overuse of devices. Um, I'm a very, actually very minimal. Okay. I'm so, maybe an hour a day in a 24 hour period. Right, right. Just one I'm doing it more here because I'm watching movies on my phone. That's, yeah. yeah. So just limit that, and then of course, like they're already saying, time out in nature. It's yep. That. Anything that's like walking, balancing, etc. Well, I think I've done that just at least in my house, I and mean, I built a pond, a waterfall, and turtles. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I mean, I've got a pretty cool. nice. Well, you're your own boss, so yeah, I mean, you can you can tell yourself you want to spend an hour. Right. Right. I would definitely spend as much time in meditation and mindfulness as you can every day. Definitely. I would make sure that you're doing mobility and you're doing some kind of physical activity every day. And I, you know, I can't determine what that is for you, but some days it may be something more extreme than others. Yeah. But every day, make sure that you're exercising and you're walking or you're jogging or you're push-ups or pull-ups or something like that. But you can spend, I mean, if, if you're really retired, you could wake up every morning and spend 30 minutes to an hour in, in mindfulness meditation. And that it can include like your walk. So when I get up in the morning and I'm walking, that's my mindfulness meditation as well. So before I get out of bed, I'm meditating for about 30 minutes. Yeah. I get out of bed and I go for a sunrise walk. And that's a form of my meditation as well. Yeah. My evening walk with my wife is the time where we will discuss anything that needs to be discussed. So for example, if there's a stress or there's a trigger or there's a financial question or anything like that, our evening walk is our time to do that together. Yeah. And it, we take as long as we need away from any distractions. We're not at home. We don't bring any of that home. And so we're out and this is like, okay, I want to discuss this. I want to discuss this one. So those are the times for me that are the best for me and my wife yeah. because she's not working, I'm not working and there's no distractions. Yeah. If I did that at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, she's like, I got a conference call, I can't really get involved in this conversation. Yeah. So that makes sense to do it when you, you have that time. But you have all the time in the world to devote to making your life better. And, and I mean, I get up at 7.30, I mean, I go outside and feed the fucking turtles. We've got three dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, I walk around the yard, pick up, pick weeds with one of the dogs every, you know, every morning. Right. You know, so, I mean, I'm, out, I'm always outside. And I get out, I just, you know... I do. I have a real fear of CTE. I'm right. into doing some detoxes too. Those are all kinds of different ones. I don't know which ones specifically to tell you. But the only thing that I do bad is I eat nachos and or pizza every day. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't, I don't drink. Well, no. but I'm going to tell you right now that depending on the ingredients of that pizza and nachos, right? If yeah. you if you have organic chips and you have like a vegan cheese or maybe a goat cheese on there and you right so so you can you can change that and put it into something healthy and make it nutritious and if I, and that's the thing it's like in my back pocket i have i have two dietitians right and one of them does everything virtual so if you need anything that you're thinking of, like, okay, I want a dietitian or I want this, I want that, feel free to reach out to me and I can give you the contact of those people that can help you in that avenue, in that realm, right? Because that's their expertise. Yeah. I just sample and taste and I go to the grocery store and that's, I go to natural grocers and so I'm buying these foods and this stuff. I want nachos. Like I make s'mores yeah. when the grandkids come over, but it's really healthy chocolate and it's really healthy graham crackers and really healthy marshmallows, you know? It's not like something that you get at Walmart or Target or whatever. So I still do those things, 
but I do it at a different level. So you have a lot of time to journal and process and figure out what it is you can empower yourself so you don't have to live in fear. I don't like that people have to live in fear. And I don't want you to be in fear. I want you to feel empowered and feel like you have control over your destiny and that you have some control over what's going on. You know, every time a football player gets hit in the head, they have a small concussion. Correct. Every single time they get hit, it's a small concussion. So everybody's threshold is, of course, a little bit different, right? So you've just got to figure out how is it that I can do my own due diligence for my condition and make it better. Yeah. And, and I can promise you the more time you spend in mindfulness meditation that you're going to be a lot better. But it may take you two years. Yeah. It may, it, two years from now, you may come in here and be like, man, I feel so much better. But it's taken me two years of work every single day right, to take back. Like when I went out and did the golf war testing, the war related injury, you know, I was out there for a whole week in New Jersey. And they did all this blood work and did all these things and basically they came back and said immunizations and exposures, right? You get the anthrax, you got all the other shit, they just line you up, right? You got the same shot everybody else does, same damn needle, whatever. So it takes a long time to re... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it takes a long time to recover yeah. from that, right? Because they put so many toxins and so many things, and they don't know what we got exposed to, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, they don't know. That's what I'm saying. That's what they're talking about. Everything that we were exposed to, and or I was exposed to in the Gulf and with other other 250 thousand veterans. So, you know, they tell me they're like. Well, we're not going to increase your disability because we can't afford to increase the disability for 250,000 veterans that are suffering at this point, yeah. right? And that was, and I don't remember when I went out there. It was right after that is when I actually decided to retire. But that's when I started my journey. I went out there. They suggested Tai Chi, biofeedback, and yoga. Yeah. And so that's when I actually started biofeedback here in Leavenworth. And then I did my own due diligence, my own study. It's like I feel better when I leave the VA. Like usually when I leave the VA, I'm more anger, right? Yeah. I have a lot more violence. I'm a lot more frustrated because they didn't do anything for me. They don't, they didn't care for me. But doing biofeedback was the first time that I felt like somebody cared for me and I saw some kind of positive result. Yeah. What's biofeedback? Biofeedback is the Western version of meditation. So they sit you in a big, comfy, lazy butt boy chair and they put like all these sensors. So they're testing your oxygen, they're testing your pulse, they're testing all these different things. They take your blood pressure and then you sit in front of the screen and they have different things that you're supposed to monitor and you focus on your breath and they have some cool music playing in the background on YouTube. And so you sit there for 20 minutes and then when they're done, they take your blood pressure. And every single time it lowered by 10 beats. I was like, well, this actually works. So let me research what really biofeedback is. So I went to Google and I'm like, oh. Do you look at what your vitals and all that come through there? No. They no. just monitor it. Yeah, you have a screen you're looking at okay. different. They're just doing it to see if it's working or show yeah. it later it's working. Yeah, yep. So I realized this actually works. I feel more relaxed. I feel calm, right? So. Let me study what biofeedback is. So I started studying. I was like, oh, really? This is just a form of meditation. And that's when I decided to put that, you know, that photo of Lake Tahoe up. And I started doing my own form of meditation with essential oils or diffuser and incense and the temperature being. I set my own healthy boundaries for my ability to relax. And that's when I started doing meditation. And then I started understanding what mindfulness. So I did my own research on all those concepts before I even stepped into a yoga studio. So I kind of blame it on two people. My oldest daughter suggested that I do yoga. And then I went to the VA out in New Jersey and they suggested yoga and biofeedback and Tai Chi. Yeah. So, you know, f when you start doing something and it feels good, like probably this week from the diet, right? Not as much alcohol, all those things that are occurring. This, by this time, it's only Wednesday, I think, right? Yeah, so it's only been three days. You already feel a lot better. If you continued on this lifestyle, you continued on this path every day and made the time 
to do what's really truly important for your life, for your health, for your well-being, right? And if you have the time and you have the resources, you have no excuse, yeah. right? So realize that Eastern medicine is all about thoughts and feelings and emotions, and I know I feel better. We all can probably say we feel better today than we did last Wednesday, right? So become in tune with that of what actually resulted in these thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and hang on to that and realize those are the habits you just have to continue. You have to continue that progress forward at some level to do these same exact things at home in your next environment. So, we're going to journal. I have questions. I'm going to tell you, so the thing is, you can't commit to both your dreams and your excuses, right? So we can't have our conflict there. You can only commit to one or another. So you've got to figure out what those are. So you guys were asked this earlier today, but I want you to write this down again. I want to know what your dreams, your goals, or your visions. What are they? What are your dreams, goals, and visions? So spend the next few minutes writing those down. Where is it you want to be? What do you envision in your life? More time outdoors, camping, traveling, your relationships. And this is all of them. Financial, personal, professional, any of those things. Intimacy. Love, trust, freedom, and what that means to you. This has no time limit.
Good. Everybody done? No. You guys done? Good. All right, that's the easy part. Now, what I need you to write down is what are your excuses? What are your what? Excuses. What are your excuses for not accomplishing your dreams, your goals, and your visions? What excuses do you give yourself every single day?
So I want you to think about your gifts, your talents again. You don't have to write them down, but I want you to realize like sharing your gifts and talents with your community also gives you an opportunity to share and to connect. You can't see your future connections. If you look back a week ago or a month ago, you probably never would have thought the bond, right? And that we've all faced a lot of the same type of trauma. When each one of you tell your story, I can completely totally re relate to every single one of you. And I'm sure it was the same when you guys heard the story of the other brethren in here, that there is something relatable that sparks a memory, right? Some kind of attachment. So realize that you're not able to see your future connections, and so you're not able to see really the connection that we're gonna have with each other, right? And it's really, truly a beautiful thing. It's an amazing bond that we've created with each other this week, right? So allow yourself to be present, because being present is actually being mindful. And I have one more question for you. I want you to think about the distractions. So what, distra what is distracting you from being present? What is it in your mind that you always replay over and over that you can't be in this moment, in this breath, that you can't be patient? That when other things come up, you've got to grab your phone and you've got to binge watch Netflix or Hulu or you've got to find Jack Daniels or whatever it is. What, what are the distractions that's occurring that's keeping you from being present? Now they could be financial, right? We could have debt, accumulated car payments, house payments, boats, jet skis, whatever, credit card. It could be personal distractions. It could be something physical, mental, spiritually, that's causing us from being able to be present. Or it could be even professional. Maybe we're in a career we really don't enjoy our career that offers a lot of triggers when we walk back into the office. Maybe we don't get along with our boss, some of our colleagues, maybe you've been bullied, harassed, hazed. We have a lot of distractions in our life. our own thoughts, our own beliefs. And the last thing I want to say is, I want you to have the conversation you're afraid to have with yourself and with others. Don't wait on this conversation. Don't procrastinate. It only delays the healing process. So just like, you know, the burning ceremony today, the most difficult aspect. Once you get that out of the way, then you can start having the other conversation. So if you have a significant other in your life, 
and there's things that have been built up and you get an argument and you bring up all these five or six or ten things that you're upset about it's not the time to do it and that's the same thing with yourself don't beat yourself up the conversations that you need to have with yourself and with others feel free to write those down and journal them and say okay this is what I want to talk to you about and make sure it's the appropriate time for yourself and others but those conversations will allow you to begin to heal to move on and get that out of your mind, get it out of your heart and your soul. We have so many things that we have built up over the years and years and years. And there's of course certain conversations that we can't have with our significant others, right? And we all talked about that today. Those are the ones that you write down. If, this, if those things come up and to re-trigger, it's okay to write that down and burn it and let it go. This may be something that you have to do over and over and over for the rest of your life. Those images, those thoughts are still going to occur. And so it may be a thing that I've got to forgive myself, right? I have to find forgiveness for myself. I have to journal it. I have to write it down and I have to burn it again because I'm going through that phase again and realize that that is completely okay, that it's not always a one-time fix-all. You're not going to meditate today and fix all the solutions in your life. It's something that you really have to do each and every day. You have to be mindful each and every day. So it's retraining that brain and it's a completely new process. But I can promise you that once you start getting all of that stuff out, you're going to feel free. You're going to feel hope, right? You're going to feel joy. You're going to feel things just like today that you have probably not felt in a long time. The difference, and I don't know if you guys can see it on your faces compared to Monday when you came in. Like you guys are laughing. You guys are happy. You guys are having an amazing time. So what you've done today truly, truly, truly works what you did yesterday and the day before. This process is just an amazing process that works. And it's worked hundreds for thousands of different people. I don't know how many have gone through this program, but it absolutely works. So just hang on to that and just continue that when you leave. So is there any questions or anything you guys want to discuss? And you know, nothing's off the table. You can ask anything you want. I have a question about yeah. the meditation. Right. Um, <clears throat> Um, I have, I've, I've been curious about this because, and I haven't had anybody really talk to to. to it's more like curiosity, than right? A question, but so I've heard forever to meditate. You know, I was really big in the entrepreneurial world. Right. I tried. And I'm like, eh, it's too hard. I don't like it. And so I'd fall off. You know, I'd do it for like one day or something. Like right. That. But, so then I started this journey about a year ago, and I've gone through some changes that have helped me. And you know, and I said, okay, well, I'm just going to. 10 minutes every morning after I get done with my workout, I'm going right. to sit on my, my, my porch, have a coffee, 10 minutes just meditate. I can do that. And I still remember when I first started, and even when I like, gave up multiple times before, like, I would try to like, because what I'd always heard about meditation is like silence your mind, you know, you'll have thoughts pop up, right. ignore, like get rid of the thoughts, and then go back to just trying to be still or not right. thinking. I remember like just having so many thoughts and like constantly be distracted. I get an idea here. I need to do that. Right. Or I start to get anxious because I'm like, oh, I really need to answer those emails, you know. Right. But then as I started, like what I fast forward like six months to like a, a week or two ago, and I was doing the meditation still just ten minutes. That's all I do. I do ten minutes of that and then like five minutes of gratitude. And I started noticing, and it really this is why it popped up in my mind is like I mean we're laying here for an hour or whatever. Yes. And I have no thoughts popping in my mind. Really? And occasionally, like, one or two will pop up. So it's finally working. It's just taking... Well, so that's my question is, like, is that... Does that mean it's... Like, my question is from somebody who knows how to meditate. Is that normal? Is that, like, what happens? Or how does it... Yeah. Absolutely, that's work? normal. You're training your brain, but it's still going to happen. So I'm going to give you some examples. Like, when I'm laying there and I'm doing, like, a yoga nidra like we do... It's completely different than in the morning. In the morning, I still have these other thoughts and I'm focusing more physically what's going on. At night, it's more of a spiritual and mental aspect. But I can tell you, if you follow me on Facebook or you follow me on Twitter, you follow me on my social media, that I have a wallet with a journal in it and I have a journal in my backpack. And a lot of my best thoughts come when I'm being mindful and meditative and I'm out on a walk or I'm out doing something outside, 
And so that's when I will stop in my tracks, I pull out my pen and I write down those thoughts, feelings and emotions right there. And I may just sit there for a couple of minutes or it may just be a 30 second thing. And then if I start walking and I get another thought, feeling and emotion, I'm gonna write those down too. So I'm gonna tell you that to me, there is that silence part that where you need to be and change that threshold. But if you're on a walk or you're on a hike or you're something, that's also your time that you reflect and you're gonna have clarity. Like one day I was meditative, you know how I always say at the end of my yoga pl practice, allow your breath to guide your movements, allow your heart to guide your thoughts, right? And your soul to guide you. I was, I was doing meditation and I'm like, oh my God, that just came to my mind. If I don't write this down, I'm gonna forget it. So your mind truly never shuts off. And a couple of days ago, I talked about how, you know, use mala beads, maybe use an app, use other tools to help you meditate, but your mind's really not going to shut off. Different processes are gonna occur at different times and different types of meditation are really gonna give you what you need. And so you're a type A personality. Before you meditate, you probably need to work your ass off. You need to have one of the most intense workouts you can give yourself to push yourself physically to that point to where it actually allows the mind to become clear. And then when the mind becomes clear and then you go to meditate, it's gonna be a lot more efficient and productive. What were you gonna say, Randy? Um, I was gonna say, I have this, I have this problem when I sit down to do it myself, even though I'm like, oh, you let your mind run or wherever it goes, I never feel as well as when I can go, hey, look what I found on YouTube, and I can have somebody talking. So I don't know if I'm just more suggestive that way or not, but when I can find somebody either on an app or through YouTube to talk me through those 10 minutes, I, I make use of that every day. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that gets me to a better place Mindfulness, you know, just hearing the direction of the following. Having the guide. Yeah, just having somebody, having, having a special, especially here at YouTube. But no, I've got, I've got Thanks. somebody else on YouTube too. So I mean, I've got a couple of them on YouTube. Right. Did they do either like 10 or 15 minutes is a good way for me to focus. Because if I just sat there and tried to be mindful for 10 or 15 minutes, I know it's at this point not going to kick in for me. Well, so my follow up question is like, I am, like, my morning meditation is unguided and you know, right. it's just me. And what I was saying is before I couldn't do that. Like I was right. so distracted, so frustrated, so like, like anxious, could, like right. bored. If, if, you know, I can't do this. Anymore. Right. That takes time. But so my, that's kind of what I'm asking from like, because I, you know, I have other people, friends that go 30 minutes an hour, et cetera, right. et cetera. And so like, I've been yet to expand to that because I'm, my question is, is that like what it's like? to be able to meditate yes. and then you can just expand that longer and then yes. just kind of stay. Yeah. Like when you want to stay clear right. headed, you just can kind of remove the thoughts. That's truly being mindful. That's truly being present in the moment is that you're not thinking about emails, you're not thinking about all the things that have to do. But part of that's naturally going to occur because your mind can't shut down. Right. Right? It's always going to be thinking. But when you get when you practice that more often, when you practice the I love myself unconditionally and I accept myself, right? And it's not a, it's not a pride or an ego thing. It's truly that I love and I love my faults, right? And then you're like, oh, well, they're not really faults. They're not really mistakes. You start to view things differently, right? So you're going to get to that point where things become more clear and you can pocket them and say, okay, yeah, I'll email, but you're going away for now. I'm going to focus on being centered and being grounded and I'm going to focus on my breath. Okay, to-do list laundry. Yeah, I'm going to put you away later. That's why I say another reason it's so important to write your to-do list of what you're doing tomorrow, the night before. Because now it's in a journal and I have everything that I need to do tomorrow written down and now that clears the space in my mind. And so you can be more mindful and present because you know what? I wrote it down. If it's really going to stop you from being mindful, open your journal and put that to-do list down because if it keeps entering your mind, then obviously it's something in there that needs to be written down. And that's all levels, mentally, physically, and spiritually. If there's something that's help in there, that's the, the tough dif discussion that you need to have. The biggest discussion, the thing that's in your mind prevalent the most is the discussion you either need to have with yourself or somebody else in your life. And then after you get that out, then you can start having another discussion, right? and then another, and another, and then eventually those discussions become easier, and then you're not carrying those around anymore. So, once again, it depends, but I'll have a journal by me a lot of times. There's a guy, I don't know if Josh will be here, 
tomorrow night, but when he goes to Lauren's yoga on Wednesday, he takes his journal, he takes his warrior's ascent bag, he takes all the stuff, and then after yoga, he'll pull it out and he'll just sit there and journal and journal and journal and journal. I've had guys that have, have taken my class before and they'll sit there and just write for like 30 minutes or an hour and I'm like, they're filling up their whole journal, but they've got to get that out. So process it and take that time. That's called, once again, a healthy boundary. If me and you go get in a fight right now and you're like, Carrie, I need a break, I need to walk away, I need to go meditate, and you come back in 20 minutes, you're going to be more relaxed, more receptive, more calm. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. So that's where you've got to get to that point where everything in your life is kind of organized and you put it in the right time. For me to have a discussion with my wife in the morning is not going to be productive for either one of us. The time to have the discussion is at night after everything's settled down and relaxed. So there's definitely that time and that place for that conversation with yourself as well. What other questions? So what I'm having a problem with is, okay, so what we're talking about here is, how do I word this? This is going to be a, going to be a really weird question. Um, so what we're talking about with journaling and doing this method, what do you do when you wake up in the middle of the night and... I write it down. So I have, so in the middle of the night, my arm, my head goes off at 2.30 every Right, I got and it. And there'll be times I wake up and I'm just seeing things or having yep. problems. And then there'll be times when I wake up and I'm, I'm in panic mode. Right. And, have, and I'll have a meltdown, you know, panic mode because uh, things that, Things that I think about, like right now during the day while I'm awake. Right. You know, I gotta do this tomorrow. I gotta do this tomorrow. It doesn't bother me right now, but for some reason, two thirty in the morning, boom, you wake up yep. and you're in panic mode, and now you're like, I gotta do that and that and that. And how am I gonna get this done? You have to take the time to write it down. Either use, you know, if you have a digital device that's close, you can use that, or just keep a journal. I have a journal by my bed all the time, and I write those down too. And then I notice that if I don't take the time to write it down, then it's still in my me my head, and I really never get back to sleep. So it's it's okay. So you get up and you'll actually journal. I have you have two in the middle of the night. I have one of these right by my bed with a little lamp that's on there with books, a pen, a journal, an iPad, and I not this phone, but it's a phone just like that. That's not actually a phone. And so whatever I have to, you do it just right then and there. It's clearing your mind. That's something that's on you. So. To me, that's, it's about forgiveness. I've suffered a lot of the same trauma you have during the war with the same thing. So I have a lot of guilt, I have a lot of shame, and so to me it's forgiving myself, right, for all those kids, right? So that's because I have kids and I have grandkids and I just look at them and it just, it replays that shit over and over all the fucking time. And it's difficult. And that's why I tell you, it's not going to go away. There's going to be times where it goes away a little bit longer. And you're, it's not going to be there as much. But those are memories that are part of who we are and part of our DNA. And what I want you to try to think about is just like I, I said with my pain, how, how can I love myself? Well, what the pain allows me to do is be relatable to everybody that's suffering every day. What those memories allow me to do is appreciate my kids and grandkids and love them so much right, and appreciate every single moment I have with them more than ever. So we have to figure out a way to replay and retune that and realize that those are still gonna occur. That's still part of our DNA and what we've done, but allow something positive to come out of that, right? And so by my night stands that light and I'll turn it on, and I don't give a shit if I wake my wife up because I've got to process, she's gonna be awake either way, right? Either I'm going to be restless and not sleep and go through this and that's going to last longer, right. but it's going to be a lot quicker for me to get up. I have a pen. I pull it out. I write it down. I spend a couple of minutes a lot quicker than you usually think. If it takes longer, then it takes longer and then process on. Just like if I'm meditating and I have that thought, like I said, what, that I just thought, wow, that's a beautiful thought because that's what we need to do throughout our whole life. We need to allow our breath to guide our movements. Right? We need to allow our heart to guide our thoughts and our soul to guide our beliefs. I had to stop what I was doing and write that down because I said this is something that's important that I need to express on paper so I don't forget. So it's the same thing. It's not a dumb question. It's a great question. I keep a journal with me at all times. Okay. Okay. All right. I, have, I have one in my wallet. 
I have a little wallet and you open up and there's paper in that. I have one in each of my book bags. I always have a journal with me everywhere I go. So, okay, so this is going to be a really weird question now we're off topic. So, you write in your journal yeah. next to your bed. Do you have a wife that is... Nope. Yeah. Nope. It's private. She won't look. She won't look. That's part of the deal. That's part of respect. I don't look through her journal and she doesn't look through my journal, right? If there's something that we want to share with each other, then we do. But remember the other day I told you I have multiple journals, so this may be my base journal that has my Home Depot list, and it may be my grocery list and my laundry list and everything I have to do, but then I have other journals that are designated just for certain things, and nobody, nobody, that's the thing within our family. We don't look through each other's journals. We don't look through, like my family, we all sleep with our door open, like if the door's closed and you know you're having sex or doing something else, right? But we all have our doors open all the time. Our doors are never shut. So when you want privacy, you shut the door and then you know not to enter. Otherwise, everybody sleeps with their doors open, right? They're not shut. So we're, I'm raised, I've raised my kids just a little bit different, right? And I've raised my family a little bit different. I, uh, I told you about the guy that I went out and I watched his kids for the whole week and I gave him all the food and they all ate healthy. One thing he does is he doesn't allow electronics in the kid's room at all. They're in high school. No electronics in your bedroom ever. Electronics in the living room, dining room, kitchen, downstairs, wherever. No electronics in your room at all. And he says it just provides a sense of accountability for everybody, right? And then there's no distraction when it's time to go to bed. They can read, they can write, they can journal, they can do whatever they want, but they're not going to be on their devices. So, once again, that's a healthy boundary. You've got to figure out what works for you, but, I mean, I have a journal everywhere. In every one of my backpacks, there's always a journal. But I get, I get what he's saying. That would be tough. Like, your wife respects right. that it's not to be read. What if you have that discussion first. But so you have do you, you have kids? I have three kids and grandkids. And how old are the kids? Uh, I've got one at home. She's eighteen. So do you have firearms that you leave out at night, or are they always locked up? The firearms are in my drawers in the, okay. my bedroom. Okay. Same same discussion you have with your firearms, you have with your journal. Okay. Unless it's an emergency, right? You don't touch these firearms. There's a place and a purpose, right? If there's an emergency, I want you to come to me. Right? That's the same thing with these journals. These journals are going to be here. You never open them. You never touch them. Those are my property. I want you to respect me. It's the same conversation. Okay. Right? Like I ask, my, I ask my family all the time. I was like, if a bear or mountain lion comes to the back porch and I'm out here in the hot tub, will you grab my camera? You know what every single grandkid and my wife says? No, we're grabbing your guns. <laughs> <laughs> Not one of them wants to grab my camera because I want a photo. They're all grabbing my guns. So they're like, we want to be safe, right? So this will build trust, too, between you and your significant other. And it will build respect, right? Because if you give them one, too, and say, look, this is your private property. I'll never look at this. If there's something you want me to look at, you know, then I will by all means. But otherwise... I'm giving you this to trust you, to let you know that I'll never look at it, and you can write whatever you need to in here. And it's great for teenagers to use that. They need that expression too. Kids are getting bullied. They have all this cyberbullying and everything else that they have to deal with. right? So it's good for them to have that same escape and that same channel and those healthy boundaries that they know, like, I'm not going through it. You know? What other questions? Something else that I've learned. I started to do meditation on my own. Uh, my wife does this deal with Deepak and Oprah. Yeah. Nothing breaks your concentration than listening to Oprah's voice Yeah. meditation. I could not do it. No, I can't either. I can't. I'm not a fan of her, though. I'm not a fan of her or of him. I'm yeah. a big fan of Deepak either. I'm a good fan of Dharma Mitra out of New York, but I don't think he has... What did you say, though? If you can't what? I can't hear what you said. Can't concentrate. Can't concentrate. With Oprah. Oprah's voice. So no Oprah. No Oprah. Okay. Sorry. I couldn't understand if you were saying like 
when you're listening over nothing can break your concentration? No, 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 <laughs> yeah, that's Hillary's dancing. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, you've got to find somebody that's relatable, right? With exposure, you're granted understanding of that topic or that person, right? Matthew McConaughey's got a good voice. He's on call. Yeah. And then with that understanding, you can get you can get enlightenment. So you've got to find the person that you relate to, plain and simple. That's in a yoga studio. That's that's in a companion. That's at work. It's gotta it's gotta be something that understands what each one of you have gone through, right? Because they once they understand it, they have that knowledge, right? And they have that power, and then they can give enlightenment to it. So. I'm just going to encourage you to find some tool, something out there that can help you. And I don't know what that is for each one of you. That's kind of why I re- went through that the first day. There's apps, there's mala beads, you know, people tap on their fingers, some people use their rock. You can get out in nature, you can swim, you can hike, you can fish, you can hunt. Different things are going to get you to that point, but just try to find 20 minutes alone by yourself in self-care doing the practice that we do upstairs. And Jane Fonda. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm I'm willing to try the yoga thing. I dig it in the morning. I dig it in the evening. I'm mean, going to miss it when I go back home as much as I. Where do you live? In Liberty. Okay. How do I find a reputable non-corporate yoga? Because corporate yoga is just the ball script. You have to call them on the phone. Tell them who you are. You can tell them what you went through. You can ask them, do they know Carrie Stewart? Right? And I mean, you're here. So say, do you know who Carrie Stewart is? Do you know he does a guided deep stretch meditation? I'm looking for something like that. You can ask them those questions. Say, I need something that's going to calm me and that's relaxing me and that's going to guide me. Right? I mean, from. From what I've heard, there's nothing like what I lead in Kansas City. There's hardly anything like what I lead in other parts of the country. So it may be just one of those things that's a YouTube. But you're, the other person that's closest to that is Lauren that's at Yoga Patch. She leads the same class I lead to you in the morning. She leads on Wednesday nights. So maybe it's a commute from Liberty to Waldo. Maybe inconvenience, but it's... Yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, okay, you know where the plaza is, right? It's south of the plaza. It's south of the plaza. No, no, and maybe it's. That's what I'm saying. That's maybe that's your sense of community. You're going to see other people that have gone through this program, that are there, on Wednesdays. So you know you'll get to hang out with people just like us. What's on, the name of it? Yoga patch, and it's Lauren on Wednesday. I don't know what time she teaches. She's hopefully going to be here tomorrow for the community yoga. And you can kind of ask, but she's, if you want the yoga we do in the morning, she's, I'm going to tell you, she's you're going to be your best person. And then at least you have this commitment, okay, I can go see Lauren when she's available. I'll get that. And then maybe you can start finding other classes that are like that or that are comparable, and you can describe. Describe that. Say, we hold postures for five minutes. It's a guided meditation. They're talking to me while I do that. Once you start having that conversation with yoga studios, and then, or, and if they don't do it, ask them if they know anybody that does. Who in the community teaches that kind of class in Liberty? And see what they say. Or somewhere close. But it's just, you want to feel comfortable. You don't want to walk away agitated, irritated. You want to get what, you know, you're paying good money for that yoga class. You want to get something out of it.